<laughs> this is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 459, recorded on Thursday, April 10th, 2014. The JJ in a lab? I'm Dr. Kiki, and today we're going to fill your head with a distant ocean, porn, and liquid courage. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The following hour of programming is intended for human audiences. However, the hosts have made no effort to ensure that the audio feed is free of subliminal robot, alien, or alien robot messages. The hosts do not assume any liability for loss, damage, or disruption caused by strange activities performed by listeners while in a hypnotic state following prolonged exposure to the show. Some reported uncontrollable activities associated with prolonged listening include sleepless nights pondering the mechanics of gravity, spontaneous purchase of pith hats and tickets to Kelly Mantan to search for something called a monkey cat, uncontrollable fear of domestic cats, dislike of pandas, and a strange desire to dissect brains. While these are symptoms of subliminal mind control, they are not the actual reason for which your planet is being invaded, which we are not doing. Silly humans! It is all so that we can bring you more This Week in Science, coming up next. The kind of mind that can't get enough I wanna learn everything I wanna fill it all up With new discoveries that happen Every day of the week There's only one place to go To find the knowledge I seek I wanna know what's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science What's happening What's happening What's happening This week in science Good science to you, Kirsten and Blair. Good science to you, too, Justin and Blair. <laughs> Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of This Week in Science. Today we got a great show ahead on this week's show. Let's see, what do we have? I have science news about some robots, world robot domination. It is coming, people. I've also got some tidbits related to Hubble, because we always love Hubble news, and, oh, following up stories related to antibacterial soaps, and um, what's really going on in that world. Justin, what do you have? I didn't really intend this to be themed up quite like this, but I've got uh, vaginas, sex, uh, porn, <laughs> and parenting. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not surprised. Doesn't I shock me. But... Really, this is just the stories that it, I must be filtering. <laughs> oh dear, this episode might end up getting a uh, too old for little kids rating if we're not careful. Mm. No, no, it's all friendly. It's all. It's all, it's all science friendly. Blair, what do you have? Well, I have some vertebrate sex of the vol variety. I have how loneliness may affect your DNA and brainy courage in fish. Brainy courage. Mm -hmm. Hence the liquid courage that I mentioned er earlier. Mm -hmm. Well, and also alcohol. So it's all, it's all themed up. Mm -hmm. It's all themed up. You ready, are you guys ready to dig in? Let's Absolutely. do it. Let's we'll do this. Science away. <laughs> this is what we do. We science. All right, everyone. Uh, California Institute of Technology scientists and others on the Cassini probe mission have uh, released a paper that reports the finding of liquid oceans on Enceladus. Mm -hmm. Yes, Saturn's moon Enceladus. Uh, it's definitely been confirmed. New evidence has uh, uh, shown us that there is water on this icy moon. So the surface, of course, it's covered in ice. It's just so cold out in the dark reaches of our solar system. But water, this paper was published in the April uh, 4th issue of Science. It came out just after our deadline for getting our stories in last week, so it didn't end up being this last week's story, but it's big news. It's huge. Um, 
Researchers say that uh, it's measured Enceladus's gravitational field, and they monitored how the moon deflected Cassini, the actual the probe that's out looking at Saturn, off course. And so that's how they deter determined that the moon has more mass at its south pole than you would think. And so liquid water is denser than ice. Everyone know that you, you put ice in a glass of water and the ice floats, right? So liquid water, denser than the frozen version. Um, the only thing they can come up with is that it must be a buried ocean contributing to this mass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's Pretty exciting. Uh, researchers say the new results are like a point in a detective story where finding the fingerprints confirms the hypothesis based on motive and opportunity. Uh, before the results, uh, planetary scientist Larry Esposito at uh, University of Colorado Boulder said, before these results, I personally thought it was not at all clear that Enceladus had an ocean, even though people have been saying that it might since about 2005 since Cassini got out there and has been looking at it um, but he said it, it wasn't clear and now he says you, uh, or other research uh, researchers are saying that you can that you, this data actually suggests there really is so the subsurface ocean is about 10 kilometers deep over an area about the size of Lake Superior wow. yeah Oceans on Enceladus, which, you know, you're like, okay, why, big deal, what, why does it really matter? If there is liquid water on an icy planet, that means that there is the potential for uh, microbial life mm -hmm. living elsewhere in the solar system. So that's yeah. the crux of where it gets really exciting. Next we, next we crash land into Enceladus and mm -hmm. get in, drill into it and get samples and find out. And Where's then there? comes the beachfront property. Mm -hmm. Frozen beachfront. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All we need to do is put a couple factories on there, then it'll warm it right up. It'll be fine. <laughs> All the fossil fuels. Let's just heat it up. Yeah. yeah. Let's just let's just figure out how to make it warmer on that little moon that's actually not that little and hmm? <laughs> <laughs> you know, might be a, a great vacation spot someday. Yeah, there you go. Um, Speaking of other things really far away, Hubble Telescope has just gotten a new tool to be able to see even further into space. What? Yeah, so you've got the telescope with its optics, and we've been using various techniques uh, to be able, you know, to make the most of the optics that the telescope has, right? Just, and pretty much it's been been set at the distance that we can that we can get out away from from our own solar system. But researchers coming up with a new method based on the old method. Um, it's just a, a newer application of this old of this old method is allowing Hubble to see ten times further away into space. Ten, ten times? Ten times further. Than the deep space array or the what? What? But it, they can already, it's already billions of galaxies. I I'm know. Not, I'm not sure I can handle them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I can take Justin's them anymore. Done. He doesn't want any more. There's enough galaxies. Do we really need more? <laughs> we need more. We want more. We want to look and see if we can find more for sure. Wow. Yeah, so the... The method that has been used for years is called uh, trigonometric parallax, and it's a, a method that's used by architects and all sorts of people trying to determine distance from objects based on things that move. And um, this is basically knowing that our planet is on an orbit around the sun and that we move a certain amount every year. We can look at other things and see how they move in the sky and from our known distance, the size of our planet, and um, how much we can measure things. I'm like holding my hand way up here. You can see it. But how much we see, see things moving in space, we can determine how far away it is. And so thus be able to get a, uh, a parallax um, estimate of where things are and be able to see a certain distance. And so um, using this, 
but looking at um, Basically, they took data across really, really, really small angles of the sky and just focused in on these little tiny light streaks and had them trail across the sky. So they just got these little streaks across the sky and then measured those. And so these little streaks that are really, really, really far away, they're able to use to be able to, to see a little bit further. Huh. Yeah, well, a little bit, a lot further. So this is... Uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, so it's it's pretty cool. Um, they've just this subtle space motion of stars is what they're basing it all on. It's pretty pretty cool. So being able to do this, we'll be able to see um, seeing things further away. It's been suggested that being able to get this new distance, um, we'll be able to get more information on dark energy. Um, which was also suggested that uh, it's also been suggested that the dark energy might be being annihilated constantly by th like our own sun. I think that was a recent story, which is hmm. kind of crazy. Yeah, dark matter being annihilated, but when we might, if we can figure out its annihilation, then we might be able to learn more about it, which would be kind of cool. And then we can look further away to be able to look for signals of it being annihilated elsewhere by telescopes like Hubble. <laughs> so, more learning about our universe. Fantastic. I just thought I, I, uh, I, thought I knew everything. <laughs> and then science comes along and is like, no, Justin. No, you no. don't know. That's the whole point of science. There's always more. Always more. Um, and the other just awesome, cool news this week that I cannot not talk about in the beginning is um, spinal cord stimulation um, has allowed four people in this particular study that's been published to move their limbs, move joints that were paralyzed. They Four quadriplegic individuals um, had electrodes implanted near their spinal cord or into their spinal cord to stimulate uh, the nerve pathways going to their extremities. These people were, were accepted into the study because they had been paralyzed and unable to move their limbs already for at least two years. And two years has kind of been the point of no return. If you're paralyzed for two years, you're never going to walk again is kind of the... Uh, the going, going knowledge. They stimulated these people, had them try and work and do exercises, and these people can move their joints now. They can, they can, they can move their knees, move their feet. They're not walking yet, but they are starting to move. So cool. Our that robot is... future. Huh? Our cyborg future is coming. Yeah, it sounds like it's going to be awesome. Yeah. So there's hope out there yet, possibly, for uh, for the rehabilitation of people who have been paralyzed by traumatic in injury. So really exciting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. What you got, Justin? I've got vaginas grown You've in a the... laboratory. Wait, what? Vaginas grown in a laboratory, implanted in patients, this is, actually, it's an old story. The, the actual beginning of this dates back as far as nine years ago to the first uh, implantation of a vagina uh, on somebody who either didn't have one or was missing a bunch of it. So this is, this is a lead researcher, Anthony Atala. He's the director of Wake Forest Baptist Medical Center's Institute for Regenerative Medicine. The this was a uh, these were implants that were done on girls who had it's Mayer Rotansky Kusterhauser syndrome MRKH, which is a very rare, exceedingly rare genetic condition in which vagina and uterus either are undeveloped or completely absent. This oh. uh, the first implant was done 2005. The other uh, there's another one done in 2008 on girls that were 13 and 18 years old at the time. And the, the actual, the actual uh, it was actually made up of their own cells on a, like a scaffolding, 
right? It was literally sewn together and then implanted. Now they're going back, looking at the results, and finding that they've stayed, that they're operating pretty much normal. Wow. Yeah, it was a... This also may have, uh, you know, this could also have uh, some implications for people who've had cancer, that sort of thing, and have had to have uh, parts removed. Had things removed. removed, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so this is wow. one of these things that just didn't know, again, didn't know it was possible, thought I knew everything, science comes along, shows me. So it says here, the organ structures were engineered using muscle and, and cells that line the body's cavities from small biopsies of each patient's external genitalia, that which they had. In a good manufacturing practices facility, the cells were extracted from the tissues expanded and then placed on a biodegradable material that was hand sewn into a vagina like shape. These scaf uh, scaffolds were tailor made so that they could fit each of their patients. About five weeks after the biopsy, surgeons created a canal in the patient's pelvis, sutured the scaffold to the reprodu reproductive structures that were present, and it worked. It grew and became indistinguishable from the body. Follow-up testing on the lab-engineered vaginas showed the margin between native tissue and the engineered segments was indistinguishable and that the scaffold had developed into tri-layer vaginal tissue. Huh. Well, so what I'm wondering here is if they, they, they must have they took a small biopsy, so they did not take a lot of tissue, but then they grew it over yes. the scaffolding. So they've yes. basically allowed it to grow normally so the cells are integrating with each other so that would allow more complete function mm -hmm. which is what seems to happen here. This is this is really cool. Uh, <laughs> you can't help thinking though. It's like what do you do? Oh, I engineer vaginas. I, I'm a vagina maker. I make vaginas. That is them. That has got to be I'm a maker. That's not a that's not a job that a lot of people can claim yet. Yeah. In addition, the patient's responses to a female sexual function index questionnaire showed they all had normal sexual function, <laughs> and, including desire, which I don't think sexual desire comes from. The it doesn't vagina. come from no. It does not <laughs> come from the vagina. Right. No. But it, yeah. but, uh, but it, if it's if if the but vagina is not working, I guess if you going, if, exactly. So That's what I was going to say. Uh, yeah, and that is the result, too. It's pain-free intercourse. Mm -hmm. as, as also. Well, what you would... I mean, the, the really cool thing is that the, the, the vagina is a, an organ, an area of the body that is self-lubricating. There, there is a lot of nervous input, and um, there's, there's hormonal input to the area also. Mm -hmm. So... You with this working in a sense and not having you know, saying that they have quote unquote normal function um, means that they, that it has been accepted by the body that nerves and blood vessels are growing into the area and that um, that they are getting full nervous if if not complete but at least some nervous function to keep it to keep it working so that that it that in itself is just amazing. Yeah. Today, vaginas. Tomorrow, other really interesting organs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta wait for something else. There was some other um, thymus. The thymus gland in mice um, was recently regenerated huh. in mice. So this is the first organ that has been successfully regenerated. The thymus gland um, is often uh, one that su succumbs to cancer. So again, something that if you lose it, if you can make it again, get the body to but chemically yeah. trigger the body to make a thymus gland grow again. Huh. We're, we're all going to awesome. be Wolverine be nice, right? at some point. right? We're all going to have this regenerative power. It, but then, then we have to think. I really you know, would love is, that. There's going to have to be a big discussion someday about population control. 
No, no, that's why we're going to Saturn's moon and Mars. And that's where all our retirement facilities will be. We'll be on other planets. <laughs> Nobody goes to Florida. That's right. We go to yeah. Mars. You Once you hit 100, you have to go off the planet. <laughs> there, are, there are science fiction novels in which that is the case, where it's like, okay, you've hit this age as your retirement age. You're gonna go. You're gonna go off planet. You have to go to space. You have to go to. You can get a brand new body, but you have to go be. You know, you have to go get this new job. That's basically. what they tell you. you but then away. it turns into Logan's Run, and you're just walking into an incinerator willfully. Well, yeah, there is that too. But anywho, no, it's an interesting point that the more stuff we can fix and regrow and alter for the better. Mm. There are going to be some interesting conversations that are going to have to have, take place in the next couple centuries, for sure. Yeah. yeah. I think I think it's not even the next couple centuries. I think within the next century. Yeah. I probably. think that we're going to. What is that? What's the statistic? I think it's every fifty years or so, human population doubles. <laughs> it's 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 big fast. We get big fast. We got to get we're off. We're really planet. good at prolonging yeah. life, but we we keep getting rid of things that end life early. Mm -hmm. We get safer and safer. We don't encourage people to die younger. It's not. It's not in our, you know, mm -hmm. in our uh, psyche to not look out for one another intentionally until we get into a war. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, if you just tuned in, you are awesome. in the clutches of the. Yeah, you are awesome, but you're <laughs> <laughs> you are involved in this week in science. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kiki, Justin, ja Justin Jackson, and Blair. Who is coming up next with? She loves our creature, cry that stuff. Buy a pet, build a pet, no pet at all. Wanna hear about animals? She's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. animals Hmm. Yeah, so let's get right into my most uh, interesting story, or the story that I'm the most interested about. Voles. Voles my are known, or at least prairie voles, are known for being monogamous. They uh -huh. are one of the classic monogamous mammals. They are very good at cuddling. Once they have a mate, they usually don't stray. They are one of the only pretty true monogamists that we have found in mammals. And so they even sleep together, groom together, raise pups together, they do everything together. However, they have a very close relative, the montane vole, which mates promiscuously and forms no pair bonds at all. In a new comparison, they have found that prairie voles and montane voles both produce vasopressin and oxytocin, but only the prairie voles have the reward centers, have the receptors in their reward centers for the vasopressin and oxytocin. Ah, so so they've 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 both got the hormones, mm -hmm. the bonding hormones, mm -hmm. but only one species has the ability to connect to the hormones in the brain. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And they even messed with the montane voles in order to put these receptors in place and click just like that, they're monogamous. Hmm. Yeah, so they definitely found that this was the cause. Now, the next step of this study was they found that voles will quote unquote self administer liquid courage <laughs> alcohol they will drink a one to ten mixture of ethanol and water they prefer it to plain water when given the option and humans are not the only species who like yeah. to get a little tipsy totally and what they found is that this alcohol will alter their response to pair bonding and this is the best part it is totally different for males and females 
Mm. Yeah, so huddling up together is a reliable predictor that the voles will mate. And so male voles that drank alcohol during a period of cohabitation were as likely to huddle up with strange females as with their partner. Well, that that mm. that sounds like that could be reproduced in the human trial. Right. Okay. <laughs> so males who drink only water would be pretty faithful to their female. However, female voles that had been drinking alcohol were more likely to huddle up with their own partner. And they stayed away from strange males. Okay, so wait, wait. So let's put female monogamous prairie voles were more yes. likely to be more monogamous and cuddly. Cuddle yes, cuddly when they, when they got when they got drunk. Mm -hmm. They're just and more affectionate with their mate. Yeah. And the males just began to stray. And the males <laughs> began. <laughs> Alcohol makes men stray. Yet it yeah. makes the female heart grow fonder. Yeah, of course, humans are not voles. No. But it's interesting to see that in any organism, alcohol could affect males and females so differently. And I would say that maybe that is the thing that we can start to examine with humans. Not that alcohol will make men stray and women will be m more attentive. I would say more that it's just more likely that alcohol affects males and females of any species potentially differently. Hmm. Yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, we have, um, it's of course not, this is a generalization, this is not um, right. an absolute, mm -hmm. but men have a tendency to become more aggressive when drinking alcohol. Women have a tendency to become more emotional. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So is so the question is knowing how alcohol works in suppressing um, uh, stimu stimulatory pathways within the brain. So basically, it starts inhibiting stuff in the brain. Um, what what is really getting affected differently is because it, it's not going to have you know a pinpoint specific response in men or women. It's going to be going everywhere in both sexes. Mm -hmm. And then so the question is, you know, why is it doing this? Is it because starting hormone levels are different? Right. Is Could it be. yeah, is it something to do with your estrogen and testosterone levels? Is it something to do with you know, other stuff that's in going on in your system? I I, think, I wonder. I, I think it's and I, this is pure speculation, of course. I think it probably has to do more psychologically with how a person is wired. I think it probably reduces inhibition and reduces judgment mm -hmm. and allows both of those to go in those two different directions at the same time. I, and, and you know, whenever I hear one of these stories, I'm like, I've met some pretty aggressive women. Yes, right? true. But, yes, um, that's why I said generalization. So, and I, you know, so it is a general. And some men get very, can be more sentimental when they're intoxicated, I suppose. Uh, so, so it is a case-by-case -case basis. We can say the generalities, eh, generally speaking, but generally maybe there's more of a psychological difference between the sexes, and that's why it comes out that way. But between every individual, it's going to affect them somewhat differently. I'm sure you could find a cuddly male vole if you looked around long enough. I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> right? I'm so sure now what we have to do... promiscuous lady, lady vole... <laughs> And she gets intoxicated. I'm sure they exist. Uh, but now what we need to do is figure out how to get the become monogamous drug, the receptor, so that you can uh, give the ladies' men, the guy who just cannot sing, seem to settle down. Maybe he's just missing the receptor for the vasopressin and oxytocin. Maybe he doesn't want the receptor, Keith. Maybe he just needs Maybe a receptor. Good, without the receptor. Yes, that's like, the ultimate sure. fixer-upper boyfriend. The oh, I'll just need to give him some receptors and he'll be happy. He'll be fine. No. <laughs> I found the best guy. I just need to do some epigenetics and I'm all set. And keep him away from alcohol and everything's yeah. going to be fantastic. Forever. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
and no, ever. No, that's, that's like a commitment <laughs> drug. No, that's terrible. You can't, that's horrible. Uh, trademark, Chris. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, so friend. that was my that's the story I was really excited about. This one also, this is kind of on the same romance tack. Kind of. Loneliness in African gray parrots impacts DNA repair, specifically parrots that had been under loneliness as far as quote-unquote social stress, not having a partner parrot, they had shorter telomeres. Oh. Which I guess we know any kind of stress usually shortens telomeres. Yeah. It could be yeah. lack of sleep, it could be anxiety, it could be anything with humans. Any sort of stress could shorten our telomeres. So I'm not that surprised that loneliness could shorten the telomeres. But I thought it was pretty interesting that these African gray parrots in social isolation definitely had shorter telomeres. Very interesting. Well, there, it's uh, Especially the African greys, but parrots, we know that they have a lot of similarities to, once again, people, um, because they're a social species. Mm -hmm. Uh, Parrots are not the kind of birds that go off and live in isolation. They live in groups. They are one of the few species that we know to play and to have, uh, you know, to have complex social interactions and to for the uh, for the adults to train the young to teach the young to the the young learn to talk by listening to and copying the parents you know the parents um, there are all sorts of things about the so- sociality of parrots that is so important and then we get them and we go I'm going to take a parrot home and then you don't like that they squawk or whatever and you leave them in a corner in the cage and you don't play with them because somebody doesn't want the bird to go to the bathroom on the couch. Yeah. And all of a sudden you have this isolated bird who needs to be social and basically we are we are performing all of those um, terrible experiments that uh, the Harlow experiments you know on parrots. Yeah it's um it's interesting. They, they It's something that I would have assumed, but they yeah. actually finally put some numbers to it. They took these African gray parrots, they and they tested telomere length in single birds versus pair-housed birds from 1 to 45 years old. And, of course, the telomere lengths were, short, were shorter in the older birds across the board, but if you compared the same age, they were significantly shorter for the lone birds. Which we just, we're not uh, a replacement for an actual conspecific. No. They might like us, and they might like having us around, but unless you're spending 24 hours a day with that bird, doting on that bird, talking to that bird, touching that bird, it's not the same. These birds, they depend on each other for survival also because they're sentries. So I would assume also being alone means having no one around to watch your back. Right, your and so you're going to be stressed out a lot, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So there's a lot going on there, but it. Mm. I would say if you want to try to est- extrapolate this to humans, don't stress yourself out <laughs> you're alone. <laughs> it's not so much that you're alone that's going to shorten your telomere length. Find something to make you not stressed. <laughs> And, and get right. company as well. Get into the chat room while listening to this week. Uh, There's a huge family of people there. Yeah. Chatting, hanging out, chilling out, relaxing to the show. Yeah, hang out with yeah. us. Do you want a, one more really short one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Rainbow fish. Rainbow fish, uh, a lot of them are, they don't have a hemisphere that they prefer for their brain. So we have left or right hemisphere um, preference, of course, right? Because that's why we're right-handed or left-handed. We might look with one eye more likely than to look at something up close with the other eye. We kick with a certain foot, all these sorts of things. So that's called lateralization of the brain. And lateralization is found in some of these rainbow fish but a lot of them do not have it. And so they tested to figure out if they had lateralization or not 
by a mirror test with these fish. <laughs> so if the fish so showed a lateral preference to view itself with its left or its right eye, that would mean it has lateralization. It has a preferred side of their brain to use to examine things up close. And then they test levels of boldness by timing how long it took the fish to emerge from a hiding place when there was a p potential threat around, how long it took them to come out of the hiding place to get some food. They found that non-lateralized fish, a fish that did not have a preferred side of the brain, appeared to be bolder, they were significantly bolder than one that had a right or left bias in the brain. And so the suggestion is that uh, fear is heightened when it's processed by a single hemisphere of the brain. So if you're working with both sides of your brain, you're, you're braver. What's interesting though is that previous studies have already shown us that complex tasks are more difficult when you're sharing it with the information with both sides of your brain. Essentially, your problem-solving skills, one could say potentially your IQ, maybe, is related to whether you are lateralized or not in the brain, if you're an animal. Not necessarily humans, but with animals that they've tested this on. If they favor one side of the brain, they're better at problem-solving. So it's almost as though these fish that are non-lateralized don't know what's good for them. <laughs> <laughs> so they're not taking the time to think about things, they just go. Right. So they, they're drawing things from both sides of the brain and the warning signs have not flashed brightly yet and they've just gone already at this point. Hmm, but if I you're love lateralized, then you're you're thinking about more information, it's taking you longer to make a decision. I think that's that's kind of an interesting interesting point to bring up, you know, is you know, what what is the lateralization really adding or detracting from? So is it allowing us to have our higher IQ that allows us to think about things and really ponder stuff? Is it or even other animals? Um, you know, birds are lateralized. We know birds are lateralized. Um mm -hmm. But yeah, so what is it? What is it about this lateralization, really? Mm -hmm. But I'm glad I am not bold, and yes. I am lateralized. Yes, <laughs> that we take the time to figure out what's in front of us, <laughs> process all the information at hand, and then make a smart, educated decision. And this is a so I'd love to love to know. I don't actually know whether or not um, at what point lateralization really uh, clicks in for kids. Because mm. I know that like frontal cortex development, which uh, in in our species is really important for making having logical thought and planning ahead. Um, maybe not being so rash and 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 having actual decision making process, um, right? So, but if lateralization adds to that, at at what point is lateral is that is that is it an issue with in child development as well? That's a really good point. Yeah, when does one brain really start to take over? Mm -hmm. Try to think about at what age you start to use one hand more than the other hand. Right away. Mm, not right away. no, not right away. Usually, yeah. sometimes, sometimes it is much later. Sometimes it is at least like two years in. Oh wow! Oh no! Yeah. My 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 kids by by I would say nine months had a definite preference. Hmm. Yeah. But of course, it could be because I was always going. No, you're using the wrong hand. No, you can't <laughs> yeah. have it with that hand. No. Are no. you one of those parents, Justin? <laughs> you're doing it wrong. <clears throat> that's a that's a right-handed binky, not a left-handed binky. No, oh, you'll never get into college. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, if you want to get into college, maybe you should stick around and listen to some more twists because it's time for us to take a break. Stay tuned for more This Week in Science coming up in just a few. <laughs> Yeah. 
heard with more than intuition. The line of reason shows the way to go. No conclusion. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. Audible.com is the leading provider of audiobooks with over 150,000 different titles in their library. And we are sure that you'll be able to find one, if you have not before, by giving their library a try. That's right. You can start a free trial today and get any audiobook download for free that you want. So do it, and you support Twist at the same time. All you have to do is go sign up at audiblepodcast.com slash twist, T-W-I-S. Go to audiblepodcast.com slash twist right now for your free audiobook download. Twist also has merchandise that you might enjoy. Head over to twist.org, our website, to buy some of our swag. Swag-tastic, everybody. We now have a link on our website. It goes directly to our Zazzle store. So go to twist.org and click on that Zazzle store link in the menu bar to start buying now. Right now, go buy something. Hats, t-shirts, all sorts of stuff. Stamps, even. I think we have stamps. If that's not your bag of tea, Twist is supported by listeners like you in a number of different ways. Your donations pay for our hosting, bandwidth, contractors we need to hire, and fun things that we like to do for the show. We appreciate any amount that you're able to give. If it's a dollar, 50 cents, or $5,000, $50,000, any amount is wonderful and you make this show possible. We currently accept donations a couple of ways. First, we have a PayPal donation button problem. Not a problem. We've got lots of them all over our website. So you just go to basically any show page, the main page on, on our website, twist.org, and look for those PayPal donation buttons. Second, we've started a Patreon account, which is at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. And Patreon is kind of like a Kickstarter for media producers where you get to donate a certain amount of money uh, for every episode that is produced and then you get something in return. Whichever your preference, go to the website, listen to the most recent episode, comment on the show, and make a donation. You really help us do what we love to do. If you can't afford a donation, we can always use your help trying to get more people listening to and watching the show. So use your social networks for science, for twists, and tell people to tune in to twists. We couldn't do this without you. Thank you so much for your support. More than intuition, the line of reason shows the way to go. No conclusion, the methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. Put on a pair of goggles and go looking for the things I couldn't see. And we're back with more this week in science. Oh yeah, more science. Justin, what you got? Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, am I up? Is it my turn? It's your turn! Okay, okay. so uh, there were a couple of really interesting Neanderthal stories in the news this week. Uh, the first one that caught my eye uh, had to do with whether or not humans, early humans and Neanderthals, got it on. And it had been and it's pretty well agreed upon in most circles that, yes, they did. We have their DNA in our DNA. It's back in the history. We intermingled with Neanderthals. However, there has been this alternate uh, hypothesis that we shared an older ancestor uh, before Neanderthal and modern human, and that the DNA from that older ancestor, that common ancestor betwixt the two of us, is what led to us having some of this shared 
uh, code in our DNA. Well, there was a, uh, a new, new study that's uh, published in the journal Genetics currently. And they used a technique that they say can more confidently detect genetic signatures of interbreeding than previous approaches and will be useful not only for this, but for all sorts of evolutionary studies of ancient or rare DNA samples. And they said conclusively, based on what they're seeing now, there was an interbreeding period. Uh, one of the things that's interesting there, too, is they may be able to use this in an interesting way to perhaps somewhat be able to recreate the steps of past interbreedings of other species that are either rare or may have gone extinct. Uh, it doesn't give a, an exact example here, but if I'm, I'm, I'm sort of supposing that perhaps if we have a, a, an extinct panda, that was a hybrid of the giant panda and the red panda, right? Some something something or the the giant panda and the great whatever. I think it's the red panda. If there was the if there was panda, a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and we have living examples of the pandas that led to that. We could, through interbreeding, recreate that now extinct version mm -hmm. somewhat. It's they're hypothesizing, but they're saying this. This uh, new ability to test DNA can more accurately determine whether it's something that's a leftover trait from a much more ancient ancient ancestor that's just a shared thing, or if it came from interbreeding. And this this is saying clearly there was interbreeding going on. And then and then awesome. on the heels of that story, another another Neanderthal story came to light. This is out of the University of York, which is in the British collective somewhere. The, uh, and it's challenging what has been our view of Neanderthal life a little bit. Uh, we've had this picture of it being very violent, short-lived, dangerous, because we found, you know, men and women in Neanderthal culture, they went after prey, close quarters. They didn't throw spears. They had to get right up there and bash and stab. So there's a lot of broken bones that we see in adults. We see there's a lot of trauma there. It was a rough, a rough adulthood. However, and, and we know that the children tended to grow sort of faster. They reach maturity quicker than uh, modern humans. So there was this idea that this was all because life was so short, and perhaps children were lost frequently because, hey, it's a rough and tumble lifestyle. You either make it or you don't. This study is suggesting that Neanderthals, like modern humans, loved their children too. They're suggesting that there was, uh, there's archaeological evidence, some biological evidence that uh, has led, in this case, Dr. Penny Spickens, uh, who studied culture and social evidence to explore the experience of Neanderthal children, that there's evidence that they were well cared for. And and were in fact as is you know the case today in modern humans, the sort of center of Neanderthal culture. A lot of this interpretation they're using uh, base is based on archaeological evidence of burials. There is much more care and ceremonial offerings seeming to take place around the burial of children and infants that they've discovered. Uh, which makes, you know, uh, this was a much more important death to Neanderthals than, say, an elder hunter uh, type of the, of the community. So, so far from being, every time we learn something new about Neanderthal, too, it seems as though we're, we're getting closer and closer to that. Uh, they were very much like us. I think that's just... I think that's a really in, the, the really interesting point is that the more we learn, the more we find out that we really were not separated that much mm -hmm. from these other people on the planet. Yeah. Yeah. So then it makes you wonder why we made it and they didn't. <laughs> well, yeah. Uh, yeah, and 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 part of it, obviously, I mean, obviously, is we we left Africa with a superior technology. And, and you know, it's tough to say that when you say that we made it and they didn't too, there's a, there's a big caveat to that. 
which is that they existed over a much greater expanse of terrains and climates for a much longer time than we have yet to. <laughs> okay? So the, the final our our yeah, we know we know their race begin time and end time. But we just started running and we haven't reached the finish line yet, people. So there's still a chance Neanderthal's gonna outdistance us by a good million years or so. Right. <laughs> this evolution, right? They they got they had a big head start and they went for a real long distance. So but at that time, yeah, definitely our our technology was superior. And again, I, the jury's still out on how much interbreeding actually went on. It may be that Neanderthal never left us. Right, exactly. Sure. That what like Gordon McLeod in the in the chat room says Blair Baz, they did make it. We are their descendants. Right. But isn't it pretty rare to have Neanderthal DNA in terms of No. Doing it's not that it was rare, I, no. I thought it was more of us don't than do. No. Uh, most of us do. Anything that isn't a truly African descent has Neanderthal DNA. The entirety of the billion people who would identify them, we could uh, geographically as Asian, have Neanderthal and or Denisovian DNA. Uh, all of Western, if you're from a, a pale-faced Western society or even a Mediterranean-faced Western society, you have Neanderthal DNA. So the the interaction that took place, the interbreeding that took place, took place right as people were leaving. That was the main intersection. As people were leaving Africa for the first time, or the second time even, both times. Maybe there were times in between those two times when we also interbred. The the it 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 was extremely common. Um, in that respect, because if you go way back in time and look at the earliest exoduses of people traveling, vagabonding, nomading about, there's evidence of Neanderthal or Denisovian DNA. If you look at the ones that are the most recent, well, not the, you know, 100,000 years or so, there's evidence of Neanderthal DNA. So it was, in that respect, over a vast period of time, common. Even. Hmm. So, uh, well, but then within within the each of those people, it's a very small percentage, isn't it? Well, it is, it, but you're looking at you. You can call it say two percent. Yeah, it's uh, around it's although, around two to three percent. And I, this and this study also the the one the first one about the the having proven that there is interbreeding actually put that number much higher. Although they also mm -hmm. caveated not necessarily this four or five or higher percent that they were seeing because different methods can come back with different results and they weren't that wasn't the focus of what they were looking at um, but they said you know in that potentially it's actually a little bit higher so then we're talking about a human population that has again every 50 years or so doubled over the millennia that's gone by and this is a diffusion of Neanderthal. Maybe they were in less numbers. Who knows? Uh, but yeah, it's not. They weren't the dominant population. They may breed less frequent. I mean, uh, you know, have children less frequently for the females. There's a whole bunch of factors that we still have yet to delve into. Why the numbers are the way they are. But I do love to claim my Neanderthal heritage. And and you can't help it, yeah, because that's one some of the markers that they have discovered in Neanderthal may be responsible <laughs> for red hair and freckles because Neanderthals had them, and there wasn't a whole lot of that before the inter England. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Oh, yes, Blair, you're part Neanderthal. <laughs> Are you sure about that? Yeah. Love it. Claim it. Own it. Be it. Own it. Own it. Be it. Ugh. But but you can't even claim Neanderthal and act like a caveman now. No. Now you have to be, no. I'm you have to be responsible. I love my children and I... I yeah. yeah, exactly. 
Oh dear. So um, we have been talking on this show forever and ever about what could be the problems with antimicrobial soaps. Oh yes. Right. Antra antimicrobial soaps, liquid soaps, very often sometimes bar soaps, but just about everything has got antimicrobial compounds in them these days, and people love it because triclosan. They think it's going to make their hands that much cleaner and. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, the data on exactly what might be happening to bacterial populations as a result of these antimicrobial agents becoming so prevalent in our population it has been really scarce until now. So researchers at the University of Michigan have reported findings this week in a journal called mBio, which is an open access journal of the American Society for Microbiology, which means that anybody can read it. You don't need to have a subscription. Um, they looked at, um, uh, uh, uh. anyway, they, they looked at a bunch of uh, products containing triclosan and then uh, people who used, that, used those products and the bacterial populations that they harbored. Mm. And they found that a higher proportion of subjects with triclosan also had a kind of bacterial bacteria called Staphylococcus aureus. Oh, that doesn't sound good. Uh, no, that staph infections often come mm. from this, this mm -hmm. species of bacteria. Um, ah, it was found in... They, these people who had triclosan had staph colonization. Um, it was found in the nasal passages. Tri triclosan was found in the nasal passages of 41% of adults sampled. Mm. Triclosan is in the nasal passages. Triclosan in the nasal pa passages, and it could predispose some of these people to infection. Huh. They found that Staph aureus grown in the presence of triclosan was better able to attach to human proteins rats exposed to triclosan were more susceptible to Staph aureus nasal colonization. Basically, this is not good, people. Not good. Not good. No. But it's, you know, th it, it, th it is good because this is really, I think, one of the first studies that has come out and been pretty damning against the use of triclosan. Uh, yeah, so anyway, researchers wrote, in light of the significant use of triclosan in consumer products and its widespread environmental contamination, it's another big deal, our data combined with previous studies showing impacts of triclosan on the endocrine system and muscle function suggest that a reevaluation of triclosan in consumer products is urgently needed. Mm -hmm. I think we I need to be agree. sinking way more money into antibacterial surfaces. We've talked a little bit about that, that they figured out you can make a surface bumpy on a microscopic scale so it rips right. apart the bacterial cells. This is what I think we should be looking at, is not chemical antibacterials because that's so easily physical. mutated. Physical, a physical barrier to keeping bacteria on cutting boards, counters, what have you. That's, I think, where we should be looking at. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think... But won't that do the same thing? Anything is going to be, adapt, ad, is going to cause a change in adaptation. That, that of it's course. going to select for certain individuals versus others. So anything's going to have a big deal. But I agree that, I agree that, I mean, why not have a multi-pronged approach? You know, yeah. the, the chemicals seem to be the things that are really getting us into trouble, though. So yeah. why not try material science? I, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Well, and then you it's very clear you you use this on your kitchen counters and on in hospitals on hospital things. And that's pretty much it. Then you can you can kind of designate where antibacterial should be used and not. I think that's a big part of the problem is that it's just across the board antibacterial is good. You should be using it all the time. There are the people who are walking around with their Purell out every five minutes, right? It's a lot of the same when you could just go use soap and water. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, there's some people who bathe every day. I mean, they're just making <laughs> things worse. 
Um, in other related news, if you got a sneeze or a cough coming, cover it up, people. Use your elbow. Don't use don't use your hands because you're gonna Batman. then be getting stuff. What? Use Batman. The Batman. It's like with the cape. I thought that was like Dracula. Or, yeah, Dracula. He's a, he's a ah, yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. My cape. What an. Anyway, cover it up, people. Use your clothes. Use your elbow. Cover it. Catch it. Because researchers at MIT have found that coughs and sneezes travel up to two hundred times farther than previously. Estimated. What? What? Yeah. So we know, you know, you cough or you sneeze and there are big droplets and little droplets and all of us have been hit by things where you're just kind of like, ew, that was gross, you know? But there's a cloud that is created, a vapor cloud that comes out of you when you cough and sneeze and it's invisible. Exactly. The researchers call it a multi-phase turbulent buoyant cloud. Multi-phase, turbulent, buoyant cloud, which means that the traje trajectory of each droplet in this vapor cloud is not necessarily related to its point of initiation, your mouth, nose, etc. It means that it is moving around and has its own dynamics as it floats away from you through the environment. Which is a point of contention I had uh, sort of with uh, a Mythbusters once. Where they were, <laughs> it was pretty awesome. They were sneezing after having, I don't know, ingested some sort of colored liquid. Mm-hmm. You sneezing and seeing how far the they could track it, and it wasn't that far. But there was this like, well, but you know, where things land isn't. It's usually it's how it floats around the air when people get colds. It's not just touching things. So although that is the easiest way for it to be contracted is by touching somebody's <laughs> germy sneeze. Oh, gosh. Yeah, um, so yeah. the study finds droplets 100 microns, or a millionth of a meter, travel five times further than previously estimated. Those that are 10 microns travel 200 times further. And those that are less than 50 microns can frequently remain airborne long enough to reach ceiling ventilation units. <gasps> dun, 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 dun. Yeah, so circulation within the cloud. All You're not just coughing onto your hand. If you go like that, it, there's a cloud. So really capture your coughs and sneezes, people. This is news you can use. Seriously. You got any more stories, Justin? Uh, I think I've, I, I had... Um... Oh, there's a big one. Sunlight generates hydrogen in a new porous silicon. Now, this is porous silicon manufactured in a bottom-up procedure using solar energy can be used then to generate hydrogen from water, according to a team of Penn State mechanical engineers. So this could be used for batteries, biosensors, optical electronics, outlets. This new material could be used to actually potentially create the new hydrogen economy someday by separating the hydrogen from water just using sunlight. Well, that's the well, that is the dream, right? It is. It is. It says that the bonds between silicon dream. chlorine and silicon tetrachloride are very strong, require highly reducing agent. Sodium potassium alloy is such an agent. So they're they're using this combination with natural sunlight. Uh, but it, it forms this material composed of crystals of salt embedded in the silicon. The material is then heated, treated, and washed in water to dissolve the salt. It leaves a porous, because the salt crystals are now gone, this pores that range from 5 to 15 nanometers. Because the sodium potassium alloy is highly reactive, the entire procedure must be done away from oxygen in the air. So they carry this out in an argon atmosphere. They say they believe they can scale up their manufacturing size. Right now everything's very, very small. Some processes that they can use, the industrial levels. This is, I mean, this is one of the biggest hurdles currently in the hydrogen economy is where do we get all the hydrogen? 
Right. Yeah. How do well, we extract hydrogen for a cheaper... Yeah, and I know that we... I, I've spoken with researchers, and I know that there are researchers... Uh, I'm forgetting his name, Dan... Totally blanking on his name, but there are researchers who have been working on this, trying to get a, uh, a method that relies on sunlight to actually split hydrogen so that you would be able to have basically solar panels on your house and a hydrogen fuel cell in the backyard or in the basement and have no need to be on the grid. You could do everything off the grid just with that kind of a combination. Um, but there was something that was that they, the catalyst that they were using, like they it couldn't get the catalyst to work right. Hmm. I don't remember all the details of why it hasn't worked, but it, around 2005, it was a big deal. It was like, "Woo, this is so exciting!" And he's gonna, this is gonna change the world. And then silence. We haven't heard about it at all for years. So either it's, you know, sequestered into some corporate Proprietary development, practice. yeah, development process, or it's not working, and they have no news to add to it because they just haven't gotten it to work. But this sounds like it's a different, yeah, it's a it's, different model for actually breaking the hydrogen. So it sounds, yeah, it says that I don't the know. The silicon particles, they'll, they'll, they become porous with these, uh, you can have a large, very large surface area, tiny, tiny pores, and that surface area can act like a catalyst when sunlight sh shines on it, with you know water being present on the on the, the the particles in the pores, the energy in sunlight alone can excite an, ele excite an electron that will then reduce the water, generating hydrogen gas. Hmm. So there's no machine, there's no energy you put into this process other than sunlight. Wild. So cool. Yeah. So so cool. Um, do you ever have steering contests with robots? <laughs> um, mm. I tried to avoid looking them in the eye. Why? Why do you avoid looking them in the eye? Do they make you uncomfortable? They do, because they're either unblinking, and then it's like, oh, stop unblinking at me. Or they're moving, like, they're towards me, like they're going to attempt to kill me. Right, so robots don't know how to gaze and interact with the eyes the way that people do. And it's one of the huge problems at getting people to trust robots. And so researchers uh, recently have uh, recorded the eye interactions, the gaze interaction between people who are having a conversation. They've taken those recordings and used them to try and develop robots that are better at looking people in the eye at the appropriate moments. And um, the robots that they, that they programmed, they had a, a set of robots that were meant to gaze appropriately and people felt more connected to them. They had another set of uh, robots it's probably the same robot, but robot programmed to gaze incorrectly and really inappropriately, staring or just having odd eye movements, and people didn't connect with them or trust them at all. So, gazing, eye gaze. Researchers are doing this, and the researcher, Sean Andrus, who uh, developed it, has made the gaze code freely available. So if anyone else wants to make nicely gazing robots, there is code available for you. There's something just mildly troubling, though. The fact that we're focusing on how to make robots more trustworthy mm -hmm. without delving into, are robots trustworthy? Well, yeah, we haven't gotten there yet. I mean, at this point, what we're trying to do is maybe develop helper robots who will help, who help elderly um, in, in their times of need, nursing robots, for instance, um, all sorts of robots that maybe are more humanoid and less blocky, you know, just not definable, just robot, but more humanoid robots for actually interacting in certain activities. Maybe robot cafe baristas. Oh no, don't replace my baristas. <laughs> Taking no! human jobs away. 
jobs. What are so we going to increase do? the population and increase the amount of robots? So now I'll have no jobs for everyone. I know, and the robot's going to have to know how to look at you correctly, or he's not going to get any tips. No, I'm not. What does the robot, robot do with the tips? <laughs> I don't know. I'm not taking, it doesn't Might go to a robot. Down. <laughs> I don't even go through. I don't even go through the line, the self checkout lines, because I think that's a robot taking a human job. Plus, plus, it makes me work for a company when I've never been trained and I'm not getting paid. Exactly. I think that's more appropriate. Um, and then some other interesting medical uses of robots. DNA nanobots have been created by a team that um, they've created these, these nanobots are made of DNA strands that are all folded up so that they can hold medicine in a little special pocket in the folds. Um, and the nanobots can be injected. The whole idea is they would be injected into your bloodstream, find, seek out sites of illness where the medicine should be delivered, and then unfold and deliver deliver the drug. Awesome. Yeah, so they tested it on cockroaches. <laughs> I just I just love that we've got the combo of roaches and robots here. We're taking robots, we're injecting them into co cockroaches. What could go wrong? I am uh, sensationalizing that a little bit, but, you know. Hmm. I like it. It's kind of like the, uh, what is it, the Fantastic Voyage, right? Isn't that <laughs> where they went inside? Exactly. So that would be amazing if a little robot could take the medicine exactly to where it needed to go. Right? I love yeah. it. Little robots, and it, it it did its job in the cockroaches. Uh, the reason it worked in cockroaches is that they do not reject things as much as uh, we do. Our immune system is built to reject stuff. Um, cockroaches do not do that. So they've got some more work cut out for them on this project, but it's pretty cool. They'll need to somehow cloak themselves when they go into our body. Yes, exactly. Cloak and dagger DNA robots. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does anyone have any short headlines? Anything they want to run through? Oh, uh, are we going to be on before the lunar eclipse happens in North America? No, I don't. I think it's right before. It's Monday or Tuesday this next week that the lunar eclipse Green is happening. Morning. It's going to be a blood moon. Yeah. Blood moon. Because, because... The Earth's shadow will be passing over the moon. It means the sun will be behind us to the left and a bit south. <laughs> uh, so we'll get the shadow, our shadow, across the moon. But because of the way it's going to happen, it's going to be sunset everywhere. The light will be from the sun will be passing through sunsets across the globe, or sunrises, I suppose. And it will create that effect we see as a sunrise that... Sort of pinkish, burning hue will be all across the moon. Hmm. Blood moon. It'll be awesome. I'm that totally going to be asleep. Awesome. It'll be awesome. I'll totally see pictures of it the next day on the internet. At 10.58 p.m.? No, I heard it was at 3 in the morning. Okay, so I just found an article that says that it will be uh, from 10.58 uh, p.m., until uh, 107 a.m. Are you sure it's the right lunar eclipse? Wait, where, where's the date on this? <laughs> no, no, I'm sure. April serious. 10th. It depends on location, yeah. So April 10th. And, and yeah, it where... says, this is, they're talking, this is an article from Portland, so it's uh, fairly oh. close. Yeah. So on Monday at 10.58 PST, uh, the moon will begin to move into the shadow of the Earth. It will take some time to be completely covered. The full lunar eclipse begins at 1.07 a.m. So it'll you'll start to see it moving on gotcha. top of it at 11 p.m. And then at 1.07 a.m., it'll actually start to eclipse and last, it says it lasts until 1.25 a.m. Pacific time. Awesome. The, the entire moon will be shaded by the Earth for 18 minutes. Yeah, the last time this happened was several years ago. So 2011, it says. Yeah, <laughs> but there's three more on the way soon. Ooh. It's the first. It's the first in an eclipse tetrad with four successive lunar eclipses 
with no partial lunar eclipses in between. Oh, weird. The next one will be in That's October. Nice. So this fall. So if you miss it, maybe you can catch it again in October. But this one will be visible in North America, which is where I am. So I don't know if the others are all. But will the other ones be uh, visible here too? Maybe they will be. It said, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah. Pretty cool. Unfortunately, uh, that's, that, mm -hmm. that study uh, that uh, where you're reading that from was from Portland. Yeah. Unfortunately, Portlanders have a very small chance of being able to see it. Yeah, so that's it true. Always is rainy and foggy there. Well, Portland. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping in San Francisco we'll get a chance to see it. We might have to might have to drive out someplace without fog. Somewhere towards the Central Valley, maybe. Come on over. Come on. Over. I'm gonna have to go to sleep, take a nap, and then wake up and see the eclipse, and then go back to sleep. Again. <laughs> <laughs> that's my plan. I think it's a good plan. Mm -hmm. It's a very good plan. All right, everybody, I would like to give some shout-outs to everyone out there who has been supporting us on Patreon. Craig Porter, Adam Mishkan, Marjorie, Charlene Davidson, Henry, Philip Shane, Tyler Harrison, Larry Garcia, Dougal Campbell, Jason Martin, Gary Swinburne, John Ratnaswamy, John, Layla Amir Sadegi, Marshall Clark, Rudy Garcia, Ed Dyer, Tony Steele, Jonathan Kelly, John, Don Komarichka, Bob Calder, Paul Disney, Jared Lysette, Ulysses Adkins, Brian Condren, Shane and Tara Ginsburg. There are more that I have not, th have not thanked because I haven't gotten all your names on the list yet, but don't you worry. You will be thanked by name. If you have not yet, it will happen. Thank you so much for your, for your support. On next week's show, once again, we're going to be broadcasting live online at 8 p.m. Pacific time on twist.org slash live where you can watch and join our chat room. Be a part of the conversation. But don't worry if you can't make it because there is always the video version at YouTube slash youtube.com slash This Week in Science or the audio version at twist.org. Don't forget to tell a friend about Twist and check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash This Week in Science. Thank you, everybody, for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory, or if you have a mobile device, you can Google Twist for Droid in the Android Marketplace or Twist, T-W-I-S, in the Apple Marketplace. Mm -hmm. For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes will be available on our website, www.twist.org. That's T-W-I-S dot O-R-G, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts and other listeners. You can also contact us directly on the line. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in your subject line so your email doesn't get spam filtered into oblivion. You can also hit us up on the Twitter, where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Flyin, at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback if there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address. Suggestion for an interview, haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for some more great science news. And if you've learned anything from today's show, remember... It's all in your head. This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science this week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robots with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. This week science is coming your way. So everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth. And I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's
it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer, and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just better understand that we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from jeopardy. Jeopardy, jeopardy. And this week of science is coming away. So everybody listen to everything we say. And if you use our method instead of rolling a die, we may rid the world of toxoplasma. Got the eye. Ay, 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 ay. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got a laundry list of items I want to address From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness I'm trying to promote more rational thought And I'll try to answer any question you've got So how can I ever see the changes I seek When I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way You better just listen to what we say And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said Then please just remember it's all in your head this week in science, 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 this week in science. That's the end of that show. We did it. Huzzah! Huzzah! We have done another show. I had so many stories, and then it was like, nope, don't want to talk about that. Nope, don't want to talk about that. It was good. Sometimes I have a really hard time deciding. Mm -hmm. Deciding. Are we doing that thing tomorrow? Yeah. Do you want to? One? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Great. Sounds good. So I'll have to write something then. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, some kind of have a plan. Yes. I am I gonna because we will be downtown. I will probably only have about two hours maximum to do it. Mm, I can't be away from work for that long, so that's okay. Fine. Great, awesome. So if we can do it in an hour or I really, less, yeah. that would be awesome. I have to do hour or less for sure. Okay, um, perfect. I'm really hoping like three takes and out. That's what I'm hoping for. What are we? What are we? What are perfect. we talking about? We're gonna shoot a thing at a place. Oh, but I'm not involved. Uh -uh. No. Cool. You're, You're off the hook. All for it. <laughs> Go. Not team. Get out of the park. Have fun. Mm, I'm excited. Should be good. Wait, I stand for something. What do I Only stand when I have for? to. Most of the time I'm sitting. Ah, Arnlor, you sent me an email two weeks ago. Yes, you did, and I read it, and I went, ah, let me see about that, and then I went, ah, and nothing happened. I think Ulysses means that you actually physically stand for the show. I do stand for the show. I stand Are for you a standing lot right now, really? Yeah, it's a standing desk, right? What you, yeah, it's a standing desk. I love oh. it. What do you guys think? I'm like, so. stay-at-home mom just lies around on the couch all day long eating bonbons. I have sat why. once and did the show from a standing desk, and I loved it. I like. I can awake move. Yeah. And like. Yeah, I can move around. It keeps me awake. I tried doing it seated a while ago to see if I could, because I, I just wanted to see if I could make it look better. 
and I feel I like I should like do this, this show from a bar stool, and I'd have like a Jackie Gleason lookalike behind me, like cleaning glasses during the whole show. Mm-hmm. That would be funny. Occasionally, I'd like that. Occasionally pouring me a beer. What know. does it mean to play frog pants? I don't know what that and means. What does that mean? Uh, I know many things. Uh, it's a I game know. because it's really hard to put pants on frogs. Huh. Oh, I read an article recently about frog pants. Did you really? Yeah, yeah that, that's how they found out how, that, like, seminal fluid was a thing oh, in stop. the 1800s was no, by putting... Stop. Pants no. on frogs. Chastity belts for frogs. Are you and kidding? They would try to have sex, and then the females couldn't. But then they there was stuff on the inside of the pants, and then they would like stick that in the female, and then she could. Wow. Yeah, this is how science works. Before they understood, they still didn't but, know what sperm or eggs was when they did but, this. People might still do this. I mean, that. Why not? Lock the sperm from going anywhere and go, oh, look, it's in the pants. I sometimes, I sometimes, it gives us sometimes having the knowledge that we do in this modern society of nowness, looking backwards through history, sometimes can give us this real sense of superiority in our, our just, oh, duh, that's how stuff works. But the, yeah, you have to realize. Until they really drilled down and discovered the mechanics of things, people didn't know. The Wait, sex ed know. class was very different uh-huh. in 1800. Huh. Yeah, sex ed in 1800, there wasn't much. Yeah. Yeah. One day you'll get married. Then the mysteries of the universe will be revealed. We don't know what they are, but they'll... You'll, you won't understand them, actually. You'll, just, you'll have kids. It'll just happen. Miraculously. Miraculously, there will be babies. Babies. Dear babies. Hello, babies. And now I am surrounded by babies. Hmm. Oh, no, not... (laughs) I had my new show, yes. Smart App Moms. Um, Review of... It's not Frog Pants. It's a review. It's called... um, It's not Frog Pants. Frog Pond? Frog... I don't even remember what I reviewed anymore. My child was just just playing it again today, too. Pocket Frogs! Pocket Frogs, that's what it was. What's that? Pocket Frogs is a game. A boy, that's not Pocket Frogs. That's the a sound that you escape your pocket. That's the, the frog jumping. <laughs> yeah, Pocket. Highly recommended for the geekishly inclined. What is that, a different? Frog Pants. Yes, Frog Pants. Great podcast network. Scott Johnson's network. Very good. Very good network. Uh, Pocket Frogs. It's a game. It's like um, it's like digital pets, basically. It's a game where you get frogs, and then you take care of them, and you have to feed them, and then you mate them with each other, and get oh. new frogs, and then people contact you and are like, hey, do you have this kind of frog? Can I have it? I'll pay you this much, or can we... Can you loan it to me? And wow. there's like a social aspect to it. It's really weird, and I decided I don't like it very much. Mm. That's like my review in a nutshell. <laughs> Range. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> but everyone should still go watch Smart App Moms because it would be awesome to get the views up, right? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Aren't you proud of me that this is sitting in front of me the whole time and I didn't I mean, use it during the podcast? I can't believe you didn't use it because it was going up until the last second before showtime. What was interesting, too, is that, that the smattering of applause sounded somewhat vaguely like the crackling 
embers in uh, of a, the flames of hell. It was sort of in between. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's pretty cool. Ooh, transporter. Nice. Nice arm lore. That's Kiki's favorite, probably. Yes. Smart app moms. Smart app sounds close to smart ass because it's supposed to. Uh-huh. Aha! Because that's the way my brain works, right? Yeah. That's the way my brain works. I was like, apps, moms, kids, smart things. Ooh, I would like that one probably, you probably like that one way more. I like that one. R2! R2! <laughs> yeah, I was pretty sure some of these were copyrighted, so... <laughs> R2 is, by the way, I've always referred to him as the apps saving droid. Because in every movie, he saves somebody's apps. Oh, sure. Danger! Danger! <laughs> oh my gosh, okay, so I had a little space shuttle toy as a kid that had that sound. You'd hit one of the buttons on it, and it made that gobbledygooky computer mm -hmm. sound. Oh, yeah. Pamela had her baby. Yay, Yay. Pamela! Yay. Yes. Man, did Didn't she have week? twins or something? No, that was she an April Fool's human. joke. Oh, okay. She made, a, she made a new human this week. She I didn't do anything human. nearly that productive. <laughs> Iron Lore, yes, there could be a little uh, more science in the pocket frogs. There's, it's not. There's ba barely any. It's, eh, there's nothing good to that game. I gave it a poor grade. But anyway, yeah, uh, I think Pocket Frogs is Android and iOS. And the clone event that I'm moderating. Well, it's not clone necessarily, but that's part of it. But it's the future of reproduction. Ta da! Moderating it. That means I have to be in charge. I'm in charge, folks. That's weird. What? How is that weird? <laughs> Being in charge of something. I like to pretend I'm not in charge. You're, but you're always in charge of everything. <laughs> you're in charge of the show. You're raising the kids. You're raising the, you're yeah. the show. You're running, stuff. you're running stuff. Thank you, Blair. Thank you. I needed that. I really needed that today. <laughs> Take it away with mocking laughter? No! <laughs> That's my favorite one, the laugh track sound. It's a... <sighs> Dark There's Angel, what, what, what has brought Dark Angel back into... <sighs> Shotgun. So I don't know what Dark Angel is, please. You don't know Dark Angel? So Dark Angel was like, um, what's her name? Oh, totally blanking on the girl, actress brown hair. She's had kids and become much softer. I like thinking of her only oh, as Dark oh, Angel. You're sub-dancing and sub-referencing. <laughs> starting at a starting point. I know. So it's kind you of a, a futurist, futuristic, futuristic sci-fi show that was on TV years ago where Jessica Alba was the uh, main character and she was like one of an army of clones that had been created for warfare. But they'd be, you know, been given strength and all these things that they were better fighters and all. But she got away, and so she was in hiding. And then the government was after her, or the company government, whatever. So there's all sorts of interesting stuff in that. That show is so awesome. But why is everyone talking about it recently? I saw Gord say he was watching it, like on post that he was watching it. And now Ulysses is asking me a dark, about Dark Angel. I loved that show. Mm. It was one of my favorites ever. Mm. It was awesome. Jessica Alba, she was like always in her tight black black leather stuff. And Ooh, I like this show. Kicking butt. It was awesome. <laughs> That's great. Dollhouse was a good one. I didn't watch that one all the way through. Blair does get a kick out of <laughs> The sound effects. <laughs> what about me? What? <laughs> I do. 
I'm easily amused. Uh, let's see. The so the future of reproduction thing is going to be recorded by. Um, <laughs> Stop. It, it will be oh. recorded and available online oh after the event. Oh my! Oh my goodness. <laughs> Hang on, I gotta Google. I got I, I got the Google. And James Cameron. On the line site here, up here. I'm gonna see if I can pull up some images to see this dark angel. Yahtzee. Actually, I got a whole. I went with images, and I got a bunch of graphic artists showing their goth fantasy. Okay, that's not what I was looking for. <sighs> um, dark angel. TV show. Yeah, get glue. That's what I saw. That's what I saw, Gord. Yeah, everything is canceled too soon. Always. I always I'm always a little bit disappointed in sci-fi stuff because I really get into into series and then uh -huh. then they get canceled. And they never and they don't give like a really good like closure to the story and then I just left it. Like eventually mm -hmm. became too expensive to have people doing CGI. Uh, mm -hmm. Like I, one of my favorite shows got canceled way too early. Um, I think it was called Star Trek. <laughs> yeah, the original Star Trek was how many seasons? It wasn't three. very long. It's like three seasons. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another one is Farscape. I thought Farscape could have gotten much mm -hmm. longer. Farscape, Farscape. could have gotten way longer. Yeah. yeah. But that one literally, they said, was because of budget. They're like, we just can't afford to do the show on the FX. And nobody picked it up. So, like, somebody should have bought it, transported it to another network, and kept it going. But, no. Firefly was canceled too early. They think the, uh, what is it, it's a sci-fi channel. They're, they make a habit of canceling things way too soon. Well, and, and, you know, I think part of it, too, is because the show becomes successful there and maybe they have to start paying right. the, the talent. Uh, and they may not have the budget to actually do that. Most likely. I remember when I was a teenager, there was a show on sci-fi I really liked called Invisible Man. Hmm. Yeah. I loved that show. I'm trying to find it. Someone in the dealie in the chat room, find it. It was a, about a guy who was a, a convict, and oh, yeah, I remember that. For him to get out, he had to be this experiment. Like they experimented on him, mm -hmm. and um, so then he had to. It was the year 2000. That's funny. Uh, in order for him to, like, go invisible, then he would have to have this special injection within, like, a certain amount of time. And he had a tattoo that would tell him how close he was to dying from not getting the injection. Yeah. Totally. I want to watch this again. It was only two seasons. And then there are other ones. So there's all sorts of shows on sci-fi that get canceled that are really good and then there are other shows that are like they're 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 pretty stupid and they go on forever and I don't understand how they keep getting picked up like there oh, what was it called I never remember things I might get bashed for not Oh, you know what you need to do? Thing, you know so. what you need to do? And this is a story I didn't bring so I can't quote anything, but I heard Green Tea uh, they did a green tea study, and it increased working memory and cognitive ability in people. Nice. Drink dr drink green tea. I've only Lots ever heard good tea. things. Mm -hmm. right? You never hear, like, green tea will will give you, like, rabies or anything. Mm -hmm. like something good. Hmm. Bones went on for too long. Would like Orphan Black, cool. The one, the the show I'm thinking of was, uh, there was a a doctor, a female doctor who, basically, was gonna live forever, and she recruited this psychologist guy to be part of her team of people who protected uh, paranormal creatures, creatures that had mutated 
differently and hid them from the rest of the human population and helped protect them. And they had a sanctuary. Was it called sanctuary? Where they stayed was called was sanctuary. Huh. And the first, like the first couple of episodes, I was like, okay, this could be cool. And I ended up watching it forever, like till the end, and it yeah. it just let me down. So it was bad. Uh -huh. it was just poor. The whole thing was poor, and it went on for several seasons. And I was like, who keeps giving this show money? And they canceled really good shows. Yeah, uh, shows I wish would have gone on longer. Battlestar Galactica, I thought could, have, could yeah. have kept running. Battlestar Galactica. There's supposedly a movie that they're trying to put together uh, with the original. Yeah, they start. Yeah, I heard that. Next recent original cast. Um, though, although sometimes this can end badly, I watched, went back after that and watched the original Battlestar Galactica that I'd grown up on. Yeah, it's pretty cool. They're gonna watch the Vipers, you know, at least twice. The old episode. one's awesome. Um, but the, no, there's an offshoot. There was a spinoff that got picked up after the original Battlestar Galactica, which is the worst, like Battlestar 1984 or something like that, where it basically ripped off chips. And had two members of Battlestar Galactica uh, on Earth with these hover motorcycles and a group of orphan Battlestar kids who could do super... Had, Superpowers because they were on Earth. <laughs> it was just formulaic, and it was the worst show ever. So sometimes they do need to die, I suppose, in order to prevent that. But Battlestar Galactica was, of course, somebody was mentioning Doctor Who. Doctor Who is the longest running and best sci fi show ever in the history of all time. Uh, but there have been massive dry spells that we've had to endure without Doctor Who. Um, so, but it sounds like it's. No, the current version incarnation is a machine that's going to keep, keep on, keep on uh, producing. Mm, the clones. Uh, you know one show I actually like, uh, although it was kind of more supernaturally. I like uh, it was Friday the Thirteenth, the TV show. The two people, the, the the two kids, I think they're the niece and nephew of an antique shop owner who would maybe that antique show, shop owner died, who'd sold cursed items and had to go and track down. Yeah. And it was funny. It was like... Yeah, I remember look, that. You look clean cut. She had red hair. And then all of a sudden I tuned in and it was the X-Files. <laughs> it was like... I almost thought it was like the same... But then it was the X-Files. And the X-Files had a wonderful run. Went on probably two years too long. Uh, but that's probably one of the... One of the shows that didn't get cut, thankfully, too soon. Whiskey Renegade never watched Doctor Who. Uh, I would I would even suggest uh, that you, you call in sick this week to work or whatever responsibilities you had. Get on the Netflix. Start with a couple classics just to confuse yourself and then watch the most recent <laughs> series from beginning to end. You'll lose nights of sleep and you'll totally thoroughly enjoy yourself. Thoroughly enjoy yourself. Oh, Buck Rogers. I remember watching Buck Rogers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I like, you know, I there's something Buck I like Rogers. about Buck Rogers that I really liked about. Oh, Fringe! I loved Fringe. I, I Fringe, I thought Fringe. was so awesome. I wish that show had gone on longer. They had just gotten really interesting. Uh, but one thing I really liked about Buck Rogers, which I like about Farscape, is they take a character from the current modern day society of the time, albeit 1979 seems like a long time ago now. Um, and throw them into the future so that you can share the experience of uh, you know the future or a far off distant galaxy from the perspective of somebody who can reference a Star Wars movie. Mm -hmm. so, you, know, you know, say like, "Wow, that uh, alien's really dressed like Liberace." You know, you can be like, "Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking." Oh, and you can say it in the sci-fi because you're an Earthling like me. That's awesome. The last season of Fringe, I, I like the season. Oh, you know what's a show that I didn't like? I didn't like the first seasons of, and I liked the last seasons of, and I can't wait to see more. Uh, Torchwood. Oh yeah. Torchwood, I thought was terrible when I first started watching it, and I tuned it out. I stopped watching it. It was like ah, it's they're basing it. It got better. Doctor Who spinoff, but what they did mm -hmm. was instead of doing episodics, they would season theme 
a larger arc plot over several episodes, and they did fantastic at that. They did a really good job with that, whereas when they were just every show is a new encounter, new episode kind of a thing, it was flimsy. I, I couldn't buy in. But when they started, like, a larger arching story over a season, over several episodes, right, uh, that got really good and really rich. They were telling longer... They needed to be telling that longer form story with those characters. Yeah, Torchwood is gone forever, except that it's a Doctor Who spinoff. And Doctor Who itself has been gone, over, done with forever a dozen times. So I don't, I don't believe that Torchwood will be gone forever. You don't think so? Mm -mm. I don't know. The way they ended it, I was... I didn't actually see the last one, so stop. I don't mean... No, no, no. The last one was awesome! It's not on Netflix yet. Shh. Wait, what? Isn't it? It's not on Netflix, is it? Hmm, maybe there's more. Is that how it ends? Just like just ended? Oh. Yeah, over gone done with. Right. Oh. Yeah, it's over. I saw the I watched the end of the series. Like on Netflix? Ago. Not on Netflix. Yeah, on Netflix. Netflix. Really? Unless they brought another season, but I didn't think they had. Oh, maybe not. Maybe it is done. Alright. Well they mm. ended that one too soon then, because it just got good. Yeah. Um, Do we need to figure anything out? I took an extremely unscientific test the other day <laughs> that says I have 17% body fat. That's good. Mm -hmm. oh, I thought that was terrible. I thought you were supposed to be like 5 or 6. Mm -mm. No. You're supposed to be below 32. Oh. Yeah. Well, yeah, below 32, but, like, men is lower than women, and I know that, like, women, like, 21-ish is, like, 21 to 32, I think, is yeah. normal. So then I guess, well, I, I learned a little bit more after, but that, that it also, like, I could lower that number mm -hmm. without losing any fat if I just, like, lifted weights and got really buff and added a bunch of muscle because it's a ratio thing. It's so a it's ratio. sort of like, then I was like, well then what a stupid number. <laughs> but if you have just, you know, 17% body fat and you have a bunch of muscle, then I thought you're doing pretty good. Right? Well, no. No, see that's the thing. If you're still at that percentage and have a bunch of muscle, I don't but think it's... A, you I would if, probably if I were to just gain a bunch of muscle. That number by itself would go should down. Should go down. It should go but down. Also, just, because muscle will help you burn fat. fat. If you didn't have yeah. that much fat on you, you'd be sick. Yeah. And it also said that I can burn seventeen hundred calories a day by lying in bed. Really? <laughs> yeah. Like, that's your baseline. This was How many? I hate you. <laughs> it says I. I if I do nothing, according to this very unscientific test, if I do nothing at all all day, I burn like 1,700 and something calories a day. That's my, how my metabolism works. Which does explain the incredible number of avocados, the, the sheer volume of sour cream, and other insanely fatty foods I eat each day just to stay visible. That's <laughs> But yeah, I, if I do nothing, if I just sleep all day and stay, in, you know, be a couch potato, I burn 1,700 calories. Isn't that weird? That's so weird. That's isn't that what the daily, isn't that about so what the daily bizarre, what the so bizarre. is supposed to be? What, is yeah, it, daily, uh, yeah, daily intake is usually estimated 1,500 to 2,000. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. But that's with like average daily behavior, like getting up, going and doing stuff, going to work. Like, yeah. Huh. So I thought, so I thought, I thought, you know, I thought it was weird, like, you know, being a somewhat skinny person that, you know, I think I would be saving money on food. 
<laughs> it maybe turns out my metabolism is such that I've got to put twice as much coal into the furnace to keep the thing going. Some people would be very jealous. I'm very jealous of me. I wish I was. <laughs> I wish I was half the man people thought I was. That would be so awesome. I would totally rock then. Good gracious, half the man. <laughs> <laughs> Although I wish I do sometimes wish I was like three feet tall. It would be hard to reach stuff. No, no, you could just well. First of all, I would have the vaulted ceilings I've always wanted, right? I could, I could, my food budget would get cut in the third, right? I'd have more right. room. My carbon imprint would be smaller. I'd use less it's water. True. It's true. You know, it's just there's the the amount of money I spend on everything could be reduced by about a third. I could, you know, I could save the money I'm spending on this place and get a much smaller place and it would still be bigger than the place I have now if I was smaller. New movie Lucy has Scarlett Johansson in it. i got to see that one. So many movies to see, so many things to do. There's just not enough time. Huh. Not enough babysitters either. Yeah. Meh. New movie with Lucy. All right, let me let me put it into the Googleometer. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Movie Lucy. Hey Kiki, hey Kiki, hey, Kiki. I, know I know what? you've been busy. I know you've been busy. Yeah. I know you've been busy. Is it Lucy like is an I love Lucy? Is that the it's one? Just Lucy. Is? They said Lucy. I think it's L U C Y. Uh, uh, oh, it's English and French. What is this? Yeah, this might be a different Lucy movie. Look for Scarlett Johansson. Lucy, Scarlett World Johansson. World run by the mob, street gangs, drug addicts, and corrupt cops. Yes, uh, isn't there you that go. just reality? How is that science fiction? A uh, woman uh, traveling. She's living in Taiwan is forced to work as a drug mule for the mob. The drug implanted in her body inadvertently leaks into her system, changing her into a superhuman. She can now absorb knowledge instantaneously, able to move objects with her mind, and can't feel pain and other discomforts. Not being able to feel pain is not necessarily a good thing. Uh, Why do people no, put no, this no, into no, movies no, as a good thing? No. You'll damage yourself. Wait, were you going to ask me something? I was. I know you've been busy. I know you've been busy. What was that all about? Oh, I know you've been busy. I know you've been busy. I know you've been busy. That, that was it. That was it. Busy. No, no, that there was one. Did, uh, did we ever send off uh, a contact attempt to the Honda no. people? No, I have not. Yeah, thank you for reminding me. It got lost in the shuffle. Shuffle, shuffle. Because uh, we could road trip. We could road trip. To Davis. Uh -huh. yeah. we, we could road trip to Davis together. Yeah, we could take a road trip to Davis. Mary and, and I could road trip to Davis. For what now? To broadcast from the House of the Future. Oh, yes, please. They built it. Be kind of it's awesome. here in the city of Davis. Yeah. Yeah, that, I, I still think it'll be cool. Yeah, I have to make that happen. Yeah. Yeah, the whole we only use 10% of our brains thing, Gord, it totally has been shown to not be true. Right. Not mm. true. Not yeah. true at all. I am proud to say that I use most, if not all, of my brain. I probably use all of it. Mm. Well, interestingly enough, we all I'm as smart as I am, and I actually only use 10% of my brain. Shut up. I'm <laughs> saving the rest. Uh, I'm, not, I'm trying not to wear out the rest of my brain. Which is actually what's funny about the brain, as we all here know. It's not one of those things like the less you use. It's not like tires on a car. The less you use them, the longer they'll last. No. The, no, the brain. Use it or lose it. The brain you use, It'll prune itself away. Better, stronger. 
faster, leaner, mm -hmm. meaner it will become. That's right. Leaner, meaner, like Scarlett Johansson and Jessica Alba before she had babies. Now she's all soft and fluffy. All right. I am going to go. What? Yeah. What? what? Yeah. Sure. I'm going to go. I've been suffering from fatigue and dizziness today, so I'm going to go take care of myself and go to bed and maybe feel a little better tomorrow and not so Good. dizzy. Yeah. Dizziness is not nice. It's not good mm -hmm. to be dizzy. Oh, Blade Runner is one of the greatest sci-fi oh, films Blade ever. Runner. I hope they never try Star to redo Wars it. Wasn't on that list too. Star Trek movies I don't think were as great as the TV shows, even though they have the better budget. Oh, although the new Star Trek movie is probably my getting to be one of my favorite Star Treks ever because it's really well done. Dark Angel movie! Oh, I love that. And yes, Arnlor, if I get a chance, I will email you, and I will see about getting that. Yes, I've, I've got an email open, but I'm trying to actually figure out the password and all the information to get into what you're, hey, <laughs> what um, you're looking at. So I was going to do this in, a, in an after show, but it sounds like you're both leaving quickly, so I was thinking we could do this just now live on the air. Is it, should we just like move to Hollywood and try to get like cast in sci-fi movies instead of doing the show? I think that could be fun. That would be fun too. Yes. Yeah, Let me talk to my instead. husband. Okay. Yeah, who's going to pay easy. my bills? What? Hollywood. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. All right. Who you, okay, Blair? Hollywood. Blair, how do you feel about nudity? Well, don't answer that. Don't answer that first. But let me just say three words. Sharon Stone Basic Instinct, $100 million. I'll okay. just leave it there. I'm connected. I know people in Hollywood. We could totally have a big story to that. <laughs> oh, my I would, You know, it's like one of those things, like, okay, I went and saw um, Willie Nelson the other day. Here's, like, a 200-year-old man still rocking out, right? Uh and I'm like, wow, you know, did I pick the wrong career? Like, I would love to do music as a career. And I, I love doing the show. I would love to do the show as a career. But also I'm like, wow, yeah. sci-fi movies. What if we got, like, picked up to do sci-fi movie shtick where every four or five years a new big sci-fi movie showed up and we're all in it somewhere, right? Wouldn't that have to be the most awesome <laughs> job in the world? It would be, be pretty like awesome. Star Trek we don't England. actually have to live in Hollywood necessarily to make that no, happen. No, 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 no. I know, but we could, we could, we could, like, we need an agent or something. We there's got to be a way that we can make this happen. We gotta, we gotta, yeah, seduce Hollywood to mm -hmm. the dark side. Seduce Hollywood, get them to think that the hosts of Twist would be much more appropriate for delivering the content of Cosmos. Oh, by the way, um, right? that show's pretty good. It's pretty good, but I have to say, as much as I appreciate Neil deGrasse Tyson, mm -hmm. I don't think he is the best person for that job. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that yeah. I would have been. I'm not saying it from that perspective. I'm saying that kind he... Kind of hard to call, because if not him... He then. doesn't... He doesn't deliver as, like, he doesn't, like, really draw me in as much as I was hoping to be drawn in. It's beautiful. So, it's an so amazing, he, the script is awesome, right. but he just is lacking something. It's, it's acting ability. And here's, here's where it comes from. Uh, here's where I, where I feel this. One of my favorite is, uh, I think it's called Science of the Improbable or Physics of the Improbable. It's this other show he did. Where it's really obvious he's being somewhat unscripted and not heavily micromanaged or edited or polished. Yeah. And so Neil deGrasse is doing his inflections and he'll make a statement and he'll retract it because there's some other thing you have to know really quickly to make that in context with this other thing. And he's literally doing this and walking around a stage. He's walking back and forth across the yeah. stage. Yeah. Yeah. As he explains, that's Neil. Him, it, it's like him at the front of the class teaching, right? 
he's working through it, walking through it, and reacting to the things he's saying with the other bit of knowledge that you need. And it is, to me, one of the greatest, uh, greatest science he shows ever. And and I did notice he seems more scanned and scripted in this, and that's unfortunate because Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, he comes across un- more when he's he is when himself, he's when he's, he's being natural. Around. Yeah, exactly. He is exuberant. Riven, even. Yeah. And his he, exuberance. He has and his that passion. Yeah, and even like in the first episode where he's talking about like his history of having had. Carl Sagan write, you know, write a message in his book and, you know, his, or his calendar. He's, he saw Carl Sagan's calendar, which was meet with Neil deGrasse Tyson, whatever, and talking about that first visit with Carl Sagan that he had. Like, that should have been such a powerful telling, and it it lost it. Like, I didn't feel the power of like oh my gosh this is you know what dr- really got you excited like he was saying it got him excited but I didn't believe him like it was this really like something was lost something was lost there and it's, and, and Arlen, it's unfortunate Arlen, Arlen, he's really watch, wonderful and something was lost this other show. I gotta so I get the name right because Arlen Arlen says he has good speaking voice but not very good body presentation that's actually the thing I that think- is most amazing about the other show that he did yeah. because it's there and you see it and it's okay the inspli- uh, <laughs> inexplicable the yeah inexplicable no one can universe. do cosmos like Sagan it's uh, it's a great course it's actually on Netflix I didn't mean to actually start it here oh wait let me go back the inexplicable universe uh, it's on Netflix with Neil deGrasse Tyson cool this in this in this show you'll see Neil in his element, being himself, with the freedom to walk around the stage, gesticulate wildly, sub-reference, tangent, um, say something. Even it's a show that has because he's doing it pretty live. He's he's able to misspeak and then correct it and extrapolate on it. And it's vibrant, driven, alive, and an amazing show. And I suggest everybody go out there and read it right now. His explanation of quarks is the first time. Some of the elements of how quarks interact uh, were even became known to me. I didn't. Some of it I'd heard, but the way he describes it and explains it is uh, puts it all in context. Uh, an amazing uh, series of shows. If if that was called Cosmos, it would have been closer to the original. But I think there's also a big overshadow. Why you even call it Cosmos? You're a great speaker in your own right. Yeah. Just some stick to this. This is the problem. Is I think this is it. This will be my final word. It's a great I, show. The show Cosmos yeah, isn't show. for us. No, it's a great show though. I I, I, I think it's us. a great show. I'm not the saying show, it's a bad show. I'm just right. saying no, it's not. The show isn't for us. It's the general public show. Inexplicable universe. Are you talking about science? Nova us. Science Now? No. Because not Neil a Nova. Nova, Nova, Nova. 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 Yeah, he does that too. This isn't the Nova. Yeah. Science. This is uh, it's great courses. It's one of those we're gonna fun talk on a bunch of subjects. It's called the Inexplicable Universe cool. uh, on Netflix. You should check it out if you haven't yet. That that's the show more for us where we kind of get it, but need Neil to to drive it home. And <laughs> does an amazing job on that show. And it's I wish that's a show that doesn't have enough episodes. That needs yeah. more episodes because I can only. Rewatch them so many times. <laughs> All right. Well, we are going to I think say good night on that note. Mm-hmm. Cosmos, Cosmos, awesome. I'm glad it's on Fox. I'm glad it, started, it is out it there. I'm the so excited. started the story of G. Donner Bruno. How can I not love that show? Yeah, he started it's awesome. off. And the animation is beautiful. It's a. It's really. I think it's really well done. I like it. Yeah. Oh, look, it's on the uh, Hayden Planetarium website, too. Uh, Simink618 also uh, discovered There are other shows out there. Place. I am glad. Yeah, someone. I'm glad someone in Hollywood liked him, too. I'm glad it's out there, and yes, I wish he were, I just wish he were really mm, pulling it in, but it's just not quite right, not quite there. But anywho, you can't have everything, right? Yes, you can. Why can't you? I don't. I don't agree. You can't have it. 
You must have. You have to drive for everything. You have to drive for everything. Cause, All cause right. The way California's laid out, there's no good public transit, so you have to drive for everything. Mmm. You do. It's true. Even here in San Francisco, got to drive for most everything. Um. Everybody out there, thank you so much for watching and hanging out with us and continuing to hang out with us in the after show and in the chat room. And um, if you haven't done it, let me remind you, tell your friends about Twist. Tell everyone about Twist. Let's spread the word around. And, and donate if you can on Patreon or PayPal, whichever. We would appreciate it. But thank you, regardless, for just being here with us because that is really the most important part. Just making this happen. Blair is no longer speaking in human context voice with her <laughs> no. sound hole maker. She's now only talking through her robot companion. <laughs> oh my god, this is going to crack me up. <laughs> ah, dear. Yeah, and Ed, science hangouts. The air. So, how many of the human minds have we hypnotized into fulfilling the grand plan tonight? <laughs> not We're off not the air? We're not oh. off the air yet. Oh, no. sorry, Justin. Sorry. Yeah, I haven't no. hit the button, no. button yet. Normal. Humans. I love I'm... you. I'm human. <laughs> yeah, Justin, Robo Justin just popped in. We'll have to make sure that doesn't happen again. Ah! Bye, everybody. We'll see you next week.